Monitoring and identifying predators of Kamehameha butterflies using continuous video technology. Aloha, my name is Jana Maravi, and I am a kupu serving with the Department of Land and Natural Resources Division of Forestry and Wildlife's Hawaii Invertebrate Program. Research and data processing for this study is ongoing, so today's presentation will focus on the preliminary results. Vanessa Tamehameha, the Kamehameha butterfly, is one of only two butterflies native to the Hawaiian Islands. When the butterfly was thriving, it could be found in all mountainous areas across the islands. Native plants often rely on native pollinators to get the job done correctly, so conserving native pollinators is incredibly important in the fight to save native ecosystems. Today, the Kamehameha butterfly is recognized as the Hawaii state insect, yet most island residents have never even seen one. After adult Kamehameha butterflies mate at sunset, the females will start laying eggs for about a month until they die. Since the caterpillars are specialists and depend on particular native plants in the nettle family, Urticaceae, for food, the females must pick out the right host plants to lay eggs on. She accomplishes this by actually tasting the leaves through chemoreceptors in her feet. The most common host plant, mamaki, is endemic to the Hawaiian Islands and famously known for the medicinal tea that can be brewed from its leaves. Kamehameha butterfly caterpillars can be easily identified on host plants by checking the leaves for their signature tent shelters. Once the caterpillars hatch and find a nice soft spot on a leaf, they start chewing a semicircle into the side of the leaf. They then use their silk to pull and stitch the flap over top of themselves, which will help protect them from predators, weather, and other hazards. The caterpillars will then go through five instars, gradually eating and upsizing their shelters as they age and molt. The Hawaii River Program began work on the Pulelehua project in 2017 with the goal of re-establishing the Kamehameha butterfly to the southern Ko'olau, where the species have been extirpated from over recent decades. A study by Colby Maeda in 2015 looked at bird and ant predation on Kamehameha butterfly caterpillars using exclusionary barriers and found that the predation pressure differed by area. With this knowledge, the team hoped that by reintroducing the butterflies to an area where host plants have been restored, such as the Manoa Cliff Restoration Area, the predation pressure would not be insurmountable. But when the caterpillars all disappeared before reaching pupation, it was clear that the problem was even worse than feared. Reintroduction efforts were paused in 2019 to identify the primary predators that were preventing the butterfly population from taking hold. In 2020, the project was picked up again and redesigned to capture the predators in the act. Each time a caterpillar is deployed, the date, tree, height, and instar of the caterpillar is recorded. The caterpillars are then monitored on a continuous Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule, at which point any survivors are updated with their current instar. Any missing or dead caterpillars are recorded along with any notable evidence to their disappearance, such as remains, an empty shelter, or a nearby predator. Missing or dead caterpillars are then replaced by new ones from the lab and the process continues. Select leaves are fixed with a small field camera that is left to record any activity for a few monitoring periods. Any predator interactions are captured and can be compared against the predators in different areas to provide a fuller picture of what is going on in the southern Ko'olaus. Let's take a closer look at the technology. Monitoring wildlife with cameras is often achieved using wide-angle, motion-sensitive trail cameras. Invertebrates, however, make the setup a bit more complicated. Motion sensing, when focused up close on leaves, would cause the camera to trigger any time the wind blows. A more effective approach is to simply film continuously and pick out the action later. Infrared capabilities then provide a visual for around-the-clock monitoring to continue through the night. The camera also needs to focus up close, contrary to most typical field cameras, in order to keep small invertebrates in focus. The Hawkeye Nature Cam was originally designed for backyard bird boxes where users could watch 24-7 footage inside of their bird box from their living room TV, similar to how security cameras function. This meant they fit the bill for video, close-up, and infrared, but lacked an internal battery and memory storage. This was instead achieved by installing a small multi-channel DVR that can record two cameras at once, and then hooking up the whole system to a deep cycle battery and solar panel. The battery and SD card for the DVR must be switched out every two to three days, so hiking with a heavy battery became the new normal. Shown in the photos here, small Tupperware containers were also fitted over each camera to keep them dry. Dark pantyhose was then wrapped over the infrared diodes to partially dim their intense light and maintain proper exposure for the video subjects. 
Each individual that is deployed in the field is assigned an identification number that will be used to track its status each monitoring day. If we look at Caterpillar 633, for example, we can see that it was deployed on January 4th and presumably survived until January 8th. Recording each monitoring status as a separate entry allows us to go back and dive deeper into each Caterpillar's life history. The data is then extracted and summarized in a single line to show the whole story at a glance. Caterpillar 633 happened to be on camera, and video footage revealed that it was actually the victim of a warbling white eye, or Huawei, on January 7th at precisely 4.09 p.m. Going through months of 24-7 video footage to find a singular predation event for each caterpillar can be quite a time-consuming challenge. Certain techniques are used to make this easier, such as taking a photo of the leaves that are on camera when monitoring the caterpillars. Since the caterpillars make small tent shelters in the leaves, it is easily discernible where each caterpillar is or was. In general, a caterpillar will live in just one shelter for multiple days, making the shelters a helpful tool to track their positions. Using the markup tool on the iPhone camera, each shelter is circled with a color to indicate if there is a caterpillar present or not. If a shelter is circled in red, this will tell me later that the caterpillar is missing and to keep a special eye out for any action when I review the footage. Likewise, I can ignore any shelter circled in green for the given monitoring round. Let's take a look at some of the findings. Sometimes, the predators make their intentions very obvious. Other times, wait, what? Let's see that again. A warbling white-eye jumps onto the branch, snags the third instar caterpillar, and gives it a good shake before gobbling it down. Here you can see that it actually checks to make sure the camera is rolling before grabbing a fifth instar that is finally getting ready to graduate to butterfly school. Invasive species have no shame these days. While data collection spanned from November 11, 2020 to June 4, 2021, the camera footage has only been evaluated from December 14 through January 22 due to the lengthy review process. The current breakdown of predators shown here exemplifies just how much more pervasive the warbling white eye is as a predator. 78% indicates that of the 83 caterpillars that disappeared on camera during this time period, an astounding 65 were linked to white eye predation events. The next largest category is unknown at 13%. There are a number of factors that could result in an unknown outcome for a caterpillar, such as it relocating off camera while out of view on the far side of a branch, getting knocked off in bad weather, or simply being so small that the lower resolution of the camera makes the event imperceptible. The red-billed Leothrix and the red-vented Bulbul are the two other bird contenders, but with only a handful of events, it is just too soon to start labeling them as the bad guys. Perhaps the most surprising category of all is the invertebrates, with only two events linked to crickets. From practice trials at the lab, we know that certain ant species, like big-headed ants, will voraciously attack the caterpillars throughout their lifespan. Although multiple ant species were identified within the restoration area, including the trees where cameras were positioned, no ant events were recorded. As more footage is reviewed and the cameras are relocated to different areas, it will be interesting to watch if and how this distribution changes. The caterpillars go through a pretty impressive transformation from hatching as first instars to getting ready to pupate as fifth instars, so it makes sense that the predation pressure could change over their lifespan as well. A binary logistic regression test was run using a Bonferroni correction for multiple comparisons. Predation was significantly higher for third and fourth instars when compared with firsts, seconds, and fifths, demonstrating that the challenge to survive fluctuates throughout a caterpillar's lifetime. We can speculate that this is due to the fact that first and second instars are so small that the reward may not always be worth the energy. On the other hand, fifth instars can be so large that small beaked birds like the white eye may struggle to consume them. The soft green coloration of fifth instars along with their spiked heads also helps to camouflage them against the underside of leaves and disguise them as mamaki flowers. Despite this, the chance of surviving all five instars until pupation is likely far lower than 1% for any individual. 
It is important to note here that the survival rates shown are calculated based off of a singular monitoring period, whereas a caterpillar can stay the same instar for multiple monitoring periods, decreasing their chance of survival even further. Among the 2,400 caterpillars deployed both on and off camera, only seven caterpillars survived until pupation, only two of which had been deployed in the field as first instars. And let's not forget about the time spent as a pupa and butterfly. With how high bird intelligence can be, it was necessary to test what impact the camera's presence had on the survival rate. As it turns out, the camera acted as somewhat of a deterrence and raised the chances that any given caterpillar on camera will survive one monitoring period. While this does add bias to the data, it fortunately does not diminish the findings that invasive birds, particularly the warbling white-eye, are primary predators of Kamehameha butterfly caterpillars within the Manoa Cliff restoration area. What it also tells us is that there is even more going on where we can't see and that there could be other players we are entirely unaware of. Like any study that takes place in the field, there are confounding factors that may impact the data. The weather, bird phenology, and higher caterpillar densities could all influence the survival rate of the monitored caterpillars. While the caterpillars are generally very good at hanging on in severe weather, this can be made more difficult when they are in the process of molting and rely heavily on the shelter to keep them from falling. Bird nesting season also has the potential to alter the degree to which they are going hunting. And finally, extra caterpillars that were not being monitored were deployed in the field to help simulate a more realistic habitat where female butterflies would lay hundreds of eggs. Preliminary analysis may suggest that higher densities of caterpillar deployments leads to a lower overall survival rate, since predators might key in to the larger influx of a new food source. As more data is collected, these trends may reveal themselves further and provide a fuller picture of what we're really up against. Mahalo Nui Loa to the Manoa Cliff Restoration Project for restoring butterfly habitat and allowing us to conduct this study for the past year. I would also like to thank Will Haynes for proposing the project and for his continual guidance. And finally, mahalo to all my coworkers at HIP for all the support and literally sharing the load of hiking with a heavy battery. Thanks for listening.